Last week we looked at Joseph, one of the principal characters of biblical history, and we looked at only seven ways in which Joseph provides for us a picture of Jesus Christ. I mentioned in doing that that some have compiled quite a list, far greater than seven. In fact, one writer that I have read has over a hundred different ways that he has identified in which Joseph pictures the Lord Jesus. Probably the closest picture to Jesus in Scripture other than Jesus himself. Just by way of reminder to you, Joseph was sold by his brothers who hated him. They hated him because their father loved him best of all. Provided for him a coat of many colors to prove it. And one day as his father sent Joseph to find his brothers to inquire of their safety and health, they saw him coming afar off and said, there's that dreamer, let's do him in. They wanted to kill him. They decided instead to put him in a pit nearby as they pondered what to do with him. One of the brothers, named Judah, observed a wandering caravan of people heading toward Egypt and said, let's not kill him. Let's sell him. Let's sell them to these wandering people and let's get something out of this deal. The brothers readily agreed and they sold their brother Joseph to the wandering nomads despite, and the scriptures tell us, despite the cries and the pleadings of Joseph. They shut their ears to it and sold him. We won't go through the long part of the story, but God elevates him to number two in Egypt to manage the bounty that God said would come, followed by seven years of famine. Joseph is in charge. The brothers are hungry. They decide... We hear there's food in Egypt. And so the brothers go down to Egypt to buy food. Of course, unaware that their hated brother had risen to number two in Egypt, the man in charge of, that's right, all of the food, with whom they would have to deal personally in order to get any food. They come before Joseph. Joseph spots them. Ah, my brothers. My brothers. Can you imagine the mixture of emotions that must have flooded over Joseph? Seeing his brothers. Wondering, are these guys the still the rascals that they were when they sold me? Or have they changed? And thus began a series of tests that Joseph gave to his brothers to find out if, in fact, they had changed. He threw them in prison, for starters. And then he said to them, I'll tell you what. You know, you told me that you've got a younger brother. He's not here. One of you will go back and get the younger brother and bring him here, and then I'll believe you that you're not a spy. We're not spies. We're, we're brothers. We're good guys. So he let him stew in prison for a while. And then he came back to him and said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll take one of you here, place him in prison, the rest of you go back, But I make you a vow. Don't come asking for food unless you bring the brother. 
threw Simeon in jail, sent the others home. And he instructed his stewards, put their money back in the sacks of grain. A test. Are they crooks still? Or has some change in their character developed along the way? They returned home, and to their amazement, as they opened their sacks of grain, there sat their money right on the top. Dread filled their souls. They explained to their father. Their father became anguished over it all. After all, these same men had come to him not, oh, I'm guessing maybe, what, 15 years earlier, something like that, with the sad story and the bloodied coat of Joseph and said some wild beast must have killed him and deceived him into the sorrow of his soul and now they come and tell him here's our money back that man down in Egypt what's going on we don't know and they told him that he demands that they return with the son and Jacob says you're not taking the last of my sons that's prior to our scripture and Genesis 43 that's background Judah was the one who came up with the suggestion to sell Joseph Judah has an interesting history Judah had three sons his firstborn son married a woman by the name of Tamar the scriptures say he was so wicked that God slew him in that day they had a practice that when one of the sons died before having a child by his wife the next son would not become the full wife but would assume a wife a husband wife relationship with with her to pro- try and provide children offspring in the name of the son who had died this son was also wicked the number 2 son was also wicked and God slew him Tamar, poor woman that she is, no children. He had a third son. By now, Judah's a little concerned. Two for two are gone in relation to Tamar. So he says, I know I have a third son, but he's really not quite ready to have a family yet. So we will just wait. Well, time came and went, and son number three had grown to where he could have children, and yet Judah refused to give him to her. So Tamar, in order to have children, she had heard that Judah came frequently to the town where she lived. So she took off her widow garments, put on the garments of a prostitute, and sat by the side of the road waiting for Judah to come. Now, Judah must have had a little bit of a history for her to understand that this would work. (laughs) So she's waiting for Judah to come, and sure enough, Judah comes along, and he spies her, and he decides that he would like to have sex with her. And so, being the wise woman that she was, she said, I want some kind of proof. So he gave her proof of who he was. She went on. She had a child. In fact, she had twins. And you can read about Tamar, believe it or not, in the lineage of Christ. Because one of those children was the, was the vehicle through whom Christ ultimately came. But you kind of get the picture of Judah, don't you? The Judah was one of those characters that you would not want your daughter to bring home to meet mom and dad and say, here's the one I have chosen. Not Judah. While in prison in Egypt, the brothers get together and they finally figure out, you know, we should not have treated Joseph the way we did. Now, they don't know they're dealing with Joseph. But their conscience begins to work on them. And the Spirit of God begins to convict them of their heinous sin. And they say, remember how he, how sorrowful and how grieved and how he pleaded with weeping for his life. And we disregarded it and we sold him anyway. 
Isn't that interesting? God was dealing with them. Well, they're back home. Food's running short. It gets to the point where they desperately need to return back to Egypt to get food. They've already told Father Jacob we need to go back with Benjamin or they won't, he won't give us any food. Benjamin, jo- Jacob says, no, not now, not now, not my last son. So time goes on and we come to the scripture I printed out for you. I'll read it, you follow. Now the famine was severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, Go again, buy us a little food. But Judah, Judah said to him, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we will not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel, that's another name for Jacob, said, Why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? They replied, The man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, Is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? What we told him was an answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, Bring your brother down? Judah said to his father, Send the boy with me. And we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and all our little ones. I will be a pledge for his safety. From my hand you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would have returned twice by now. Do you identify a bit of a change in Judah? He was the one who suggested to his brothers that they sell Joseph. Now he offers himself as surety and pledge for Joseph's younger brother, Benjamin. Dad, I give myself as a guarantee, a pledge for your son, my brother's safety. I will bring him back. We have an understanding of a surety, don't we? A pledge. Someone who makes a guarantee on behalf of someone else. One of the common ways we have it here in our land is a bail bondsman. Or someone has been arrested for a crime, incarcerated in prison because of the charges against him or her can't be released unless the prisoner posts bail a bail bondsman comes in and says I will guarantee that this person will return and puts up money as a surety as a pledge, as a promise a guarantee a cosigner that's another example Someone who co-signs. I've had that in the past. Where someone co-signed with me to help me get a loan that I needed. Judah offered himself as a pledge, a surety, a guarantee to his father that he would bring Benjamin back safely. They proceed down to Egypt. They come before The man. (laughs) They know him as the man. The man stands before him. Where's the brother? Where is he? He sees his brother and he can't take it. He excuses himself from their company and goes into a private room and just sobs because his brother. He sees him. He's alive. He cleans himself up and he comes back and he's still not convinced that these brothers have changed. He says, I want you to come to my house for lunch. (laughs) 
Oh, can you imagine the fear that went through those brothers? And in fact, it describes them. They, they get together and they say, Boy, you know, what's this guy got in mind? First he throws us in prison, and then he lets us out, and then he keeps one of them. Then he says, We've got to have a brother bring him back. We bring back the brother, and now he wants us. Surely he's going to kill us. Our goose is cooked. We're done. We're goners. That starts in verse number 30. They meet with Joseph at his house. And the brothers speak to Joseph. Now therefore, as soon as I come to your servant, my father, and the boy is not with us, then as his life is bound up in the boy's life, as soon as he sees that boy is not with us, he will die. And your servants will bring down the gray hairs of your servant, our father, with sorrow to Sheol. I'll stop right there. Joseph had again put the money back in the bags of the brothers. Sent them back home. But in Benjamin's sack, he included his personal silver chalice. Sent them on their way. Shortly after they had left, he calls the steward and says, Steward, go chase those boys down. Somebody's got my silver chalice in their bag. The steward, not knowing all that had gone on, chases after them, comes up with them, sorts through. One of you guys has got the chalice in your bag. So one of you are they're thieves. Searches through the bags, finds the silver chalice in Benjamin's bag. The steward says, you got to come back to the man wants to see you you're thieves they come back Joseph says this first part of this referencing he's going to die he's a thief Benjamin his younger brother he is really testing them really testing these boys have they really changed Judah Judah the one whom you would not bring home to mama a few years ago the one who to his father made pledge made himself a surety for his safety steps up we read starting in verse 32 Judah's talking he said your servant I became a pledge in safety for the boy to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father all my life. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the boy as a servant to my Lord. And let the boy go back with his brothers, for how can I go back to my father if the boy is not with me? I fear to see the evil that would befall my father. What's he become? A substitute. Not only a surety, but he goes the extra mile to where he offers himself. I will take his place. Okay, according to your judgment, my brother Benjamin deserves death. I will take his place. Send him back. Release him. Free him. I will take his place. What a change. What a change. Judah, the one who sold Joseph, becoming a substitute for his brother. Well, very much in a nutshell, the rest of the story, Joseph couldn't take it any longer. I'm Joseph. I'm your brother. And he revealed himself to them. And then the brothers went home and the family moved down to Egypt to be with Joseph so they could have plenty of food to sustain life. Why would God move upon Moses to include these series of events in this history of Judah? Why Judah? 
He's the fourth born. He's not the first born. He's the fourth born. And when Jacob gave the blessings to his children, which you can read later on, I believe it's Genesis 49, where he begins to give the blessings to all of his sons, it is Judah to whom he gives the firstborn's blessing. Judah. The scoundrel. The skunk. What does God want us to see? He wants us to see several things. He wants us to see the change in Judah. Aren't we all little Judas at heart? We're all scoundrels. We're all liars and thieves. We're all sinners. Now, we don't like to call ourselves that. We like to kind of brush ourselves up and say, Oh, I'm not so bad. I'm not as bad as that one. In whose eyes are you not as bad as that one? Not in the judge's eyes. We're all Judas at heart. And God wants us to see ourselves in Judah. Because God changed Judah. God worked with him through the series of events of life, through meeting with Joseph and Joseph's tests of his character. God worked in the heart and life of Judah and changed him from a scoundrel to a substitute on behalf of his brother. He also wants us to see how Judah provides a link to God's plan of redemption. God had a wondrous plan when he created the heavens and the earth. It says he looked upon all of it at the end of it on six days and he said he looked at it all and it was very good. Very good. No sin, no evil, no hostilities. Sin entered. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. They chose to yield to the temptation of the serpent instead of obeying the voice of God. God in grace and in mercy came down to them and made a promise. I will send a Savior. I will send someone, the seed of the woman, who will crush the head of that evil, vile serpent. And from that point throughout the rest of Scripture, God progressively reveals that plan. How it would come to fruition. Begin to give to us pictures of this Messiah who would come. And providing it for those people of that day, through the prophets explaining this Messiah so that they would not miss it and so that they would trust God in anticipation of this Messiah who would come Judah Judah oh he gives us a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus the scriptures describe for us the Lord Jesus as a surety that's Hebrews chapter 7 I didn't put that verse on the list if you want to write it down it's Hebrews 7 I think verse number 22 he is a surety a promise a pledge that what God began he is fulfilled in Christ and then we see the scriptures provide for us that not only did Jesus become a surety and a pledge, he became a substitute. A substitute. Look at verse number Matthew twenty twenty eight. It says, Even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, this is Jesus talking, and to give his life a ransom, for many Jesus didn't come to earth and die on his own behalf or for himself 
He was the spotless, sinless, holy Son of God. He didn't need to do that for Himself. He was one with God already. He came down and took upon Himself human flesh to become a substitute. For whom, you ask? Scoundrels and sinners like you and me? That's for whom He came. That He might give a ransom for many. Then we read the next verse from Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. It says, While you were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person. How many people will die for somebody else? Well, not very often. Maybe for a really righteous one, maybe. Though perhaps for a good person, one would dare even to die. But God shows His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, He died for us. A substitute. God, through Moses, provided for the children of Israel and for succeeding generations a description pictured in Judah of the one who would come through the line of Judah. The surety of all sureties. The substitute of all substitutes. Fulfilled completely in Christ Jesus. How does that correlate to you and me? How does that fit in our day and our lives to us? He wants us to see Judah from what he was to what he became and God's work in his life, changing him, conforming him progressively into more righteous character. He wants us to see the picture of Judah, the picture of Christ, the surety and the substitute on behalf of those who deserve judgment by law Benjamin deserved judgment and you say it was a put up job (laughs) yeah in some ways it was a put up job but according to the law he was found guilty Judah became the substitute for one who deserved judgment in the same fashion Christ Jesus became a substitutionary sacrifice in payment to his father of the penalty that you and I deserve to pay. And he paid it. And he paid it in full. And Jesus said that anyone who comes to me and believes upon me shall reap the benefits of the sacrifice that I make. They'll have eternal life. We read in John chapter 1, describing the Lord Jesus. He came unto his own. He came to his family. He came to Jews initially. He came to the lost tribes of Israel, it says. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Which crowd are you in? Are you in the crowd like those when he came the first time who did not receive him? Or are you in the crowd who believes? Two crowds, only two. Not four, not five, not a train load. With everybody in their own boxcar. And everybody's going to the same destination. No. There's two crowds. Those who believe and those who don't. Jesus said, I am the way. The truth and the life. No man will get to the Father except through me. And in 1 Timothy 2.5, there's one God and one mediator between God and man. The man Christ Jesus, the substitute. God wants us to see His grace and mercy, 
His provision on behalf of people like you and like me. What can the Spirit of God do with these truths in your life today? Well, He can open your eyes to see the truth and help you distinguish truth from error. He can help you to see yourself in the life of Judah and what God can make of one even as evil and wicked as Judah. He can change that life and turn it unto holiness. Where is the Spirit of God spoken to you today and opened your eyes to see your failure to know and understand the truth and to believe the truth? How will you respond? You can reject it all. You can say, I like Tom, he's a nice guy, he's friendly, he means well, but I don't think he's a little skittywampus on this. I, I, I don't think it's true. I'll just continue to do the best I can and hope for the best. If that's your plan, my friend, let me tell you your best that you'll get is an eternal damnation. God isn't fooling. He's not playing games. This is serious business. You can reject it. You can do that. You can say tomorrow. Tomorrow. You know, I'll think about this. I'll ponder it. I'll do it tomorrow. What was that? What did we call that when our kids did that and we told them to clean up their room and they said, Mom, I'll do that on Tuesday. And this was on Monday when we told them. What do we call that? Procrastination. We call it procrastination and we call it disobedience is what we call it. Delayed obedience is disobedience. It's a rejection of the command. So to relegate it until tomorrow doesn't absolve you from the guilt today. You can rejoice. You can say, I know that substitute. (laughs) I believe. He came. I heard. Someone spoke to me. And I heard and I believe and I know that Savior substitute, Jesus. I've trusted Him. Do you need to make any changes? Are you here today perhaps and you've never trusted Him? You have trusted in yourself and your own attempts to try and please God. The scriptures tell us there's only one way to please God and to satisfy Him and the demands that He has upon you and that's through Jesus, the substitute. And so today I call upon you, I urge you, come to Jesus. Trust Him. Call upon Him. He is the one who said, Everyone who comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Call upon Him today and find His promises true in your own life. Let's close in prayer.